Oh, that looks better. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you brilliantly. Thank you. Perfect. How are you? Well, it's the bodies here. The rest will follow. I'm, I'm a, a, assured that the neurons were huddling together for warmth, but eventually they'll turn up. <laughs> That's for sure. So we're just waiting for the others to uh, to join us. Um, uh, Christian Envig has another meeting that he has to go to, so I'm going to put her on first. Um, then I'll say a couple of words. Then Linda, uh, yourself, and Shiva. Would that work for you, or do you have other? Of course, of course. I'm I'm good. I'm, I've put this aside until at least eleven, if not later. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what's the time with you now? Is it uh... ten a.m. Oh, it's not fairly civilized. Hello? Fair, fairly, yes, indeed. <laughs> Hello? Can you put your mic on? Good morning. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm, the body's here. I'm, I'm, I'm relying on, on, on the rest of the panel for intelligence. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> You're very, very kind. I'm relying on you to give us also some intelligence. <laughs> Okay. Hello, 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 Linda. Hello, how are you? I'm good, and you? Very good, thank you. Do we know each other? No. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but he's uh, he's gracious, and I, I, I'm right now the only girl. I, I think you guys can see my picture, so. I can, yeah. yes. Well, I, even I can notice a difference. <laughs> <laughs> so where are all of you located? I'm in Austria. Okay. I'm in, the Washington. in Washington. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, exactly. Very good. Uh, and, I, and I'm in Switzerland. Uh, my office is in Geneva, but because of COVID, it's more difficult to get to it. So I'm currently in Lausanne. Oh, but, I live in a, but I live in a place called Vevey, which is just next door. It's, oh, that's uh, gorgeous. That's gorgeous. I'm actually heading out uh, on Sunday to Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm flipping back over. On, I'm back on Tuesday. I'm back over here to Europe. And then I'm heading out to Washington. Uh, oh, we talk. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm, uh, one, uh, one of the many hats that I wear, I'm vice president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Austria. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll be working with the Select USA uh, oh. program to bring in uh, young talents, uh, sure. startups coming in who are ready to, are an interest, as well as companies who are interested in investing in the, U in the United States. Sure. Maybe, oh, maybe, we can, maybe we can get together. My boss, um, our CEO, he used to be Assistant Secretary of Commerce on the Ronald Reagan. And, of course, the President of the Chamber uh, is a good friend, of course, Suzanne. She's a fellow Georgetown grad. Oh, well, there you go. As well. you guys, uh, that we will have to definitely stay in touch for sure. Absolutely. I'd love, to, I'd love that. I think Kristen's just joined us. Do you want to say hello? Yeah, hi. It's Kristen Engvig here. Nice to meet you all. Hi, hello. Kristen and Linda. Nice to meet you, too. Hello, Kristen. Hello. It's Hakan. Nice Hi. <laughs> it's a so we're gradually, gradually getting together a full team. I think we're only missing Shiva now. Um, yeah. Do you want to give her a call, uh, Kristen, see if she's uh, how she's doing? Yeah, just one second. I'll see. On Linda's on Linda's face, I see like her. Um, title and everything else but that doesn't go away is that normal Royston no no what you should do is move the the, uh, the mouse off her face and then yeah. it goes back to the normal picture try that I can't move anything the cursor is like stuck on my oh there we go good good to go <laughs> okay there we go yeah at least at least we're not into the airbrushing yet, yet. <laughs> well, when, when I when I used to work on in television um uh, you know, I, I ran teams and everything else on the editorial side, but the joke when I was at the Associated Press, Press with a good friend of mine who's now uh, the CEO of, of, of a company um, as well, he said, we used to have a ra face for radio, not for television, I guess. But, you know, oh! I guess, I guess this, that, will, this, will, do. this no. will do. The face for radio is presumably shorts and pajamas still. Is. <laughs> That's for sure. That's well, I think sure. I think a lot of us had to learn how to manage to work with Zoom and online to coordinate. And I mean, think about it. I, I was reading an article, I think it was two years ago, where everybody was talking about how to have the perfect Zoom background or the yeah. background and all how to look and how to be. And then afterwards, after the a year, there was another article, which made, made me laugh. 
really, do we have to go through all that effort? Let's just be who we are because we are at home. You know? yeah, I, I just don't bother with it anymore. And, and even, <laughs> and, and even as, as you're, when you're working in, in banking and doing M&A transactions, we all know I could be another part of the world and pop up and I have my bikini bottom on. And so it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, I mean, I. To that. <laughs> Whereas in the old days, as, as being from the States, in the old days, you know, or even in Europe, you know, you had your standard look. We yeah. were going into different meetings, in particular in the dock region, which is where you're located and I'm located. So it's very conservative, very correct. And, and now it's a little bit more relaxed. And I like, find it's easy to do business. I just came back from Qatar late last Sunday, and it was the first time after two years that I had to, you know, wear suit after suit after suit and the ties. And <laughs> as soon as the meeting was over, I was just getting rid of the ties because I'm just so now used to it. Um, you know, not wearing the tie, it's been lovely. And yeah, the only thing it reminds me of, um, you know, that famous BBC, you know, interview where the guy is like, you know, th- you know, the kids are walking her in the wife, the poor wife is trying to get him from the background. Oh, yeah. yeah that's yeah, our, yeah. That, that's our every day now, whether it's a child or a cat or something kind of zoom bombing us. Um, but yeah, it's, it's made things a lot easier. But there are times when I miss traveling and sometimes putting the suit on as well, not every day. You, yeah, but there is something in dressing up occasionally that's nice also. You know? It is, it is. But, I mean, I, I, during COVID, I, I did a lot of traveling into the States. So I was, but I learned, but the thing was, is that I had my little suitcase ready because I do, I do the quick 72 hours and come back in only because mm-hmm. it's easier for the jet lag for me. Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I keep going, but... It was interesting. I had, as I'm leaving on Sunday to Texas, as I was telling you, another 72 hour trip, I had to go into that suitcase and check because I realized I hadn't used it in a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Change the nickel at least. <laughs> oh, my <aren't you> <laughs> No, no, no. I had to check. I had to, what that, everything with the, the outfits were great. It was just the products. Yeah, you know, okay. there's a lot of products to keep us going. <laughs> For sure. And they expired for anyway. Oh, there you go. So how how is our format? How well what what we're going to do? I'm just trying to explain to Hacken. Um, mm-hmm. Christian has to go to another meeting, so if you with your agreement, I'll put her on first, uh-huh. and then I'll say a couple of words uh, around you know our view of life, if you like, and then uh, move to you, Linda, okay. then Hacken, and then Shiva's uh, should be joining us at some moment soon <laughs> yeah i just i didn't get her i'm just sending her the email with the connection again i have to say I, it, there was one time i had a major challenge and i came in at the tail end well what what, what, I I think, what i think we're aiming to do is um probably three or four minutes uh speaking uh from our perspectives and then um have a, a q a session um mm-hmm. I think from the, I think the topic is quite interesting in the context of Ukraine as well, because social on, entrepreneurs are usually the first responders. They also the, they're the creators of social and economic value, and they're the ones that tend to be key for sustainable solutions and recovery. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and I think the last point I made, I think women are the anchors in in survival systems because. Obviously, the consciousness of the family and so on. I, I was the um, chair of the Rotarian Disaster Agency at one point, and and we we also you know you have hundreds of thousands of people, and you find that um, the women are the ones that are, that are consistently holding the families together, even if they're displaced, which is the case with uh, Ukraine. As they come back, please God, there will be a, an opportunity to re- rebuild the society. And as I said to Hakim, I, I'm, I'm a sort of vegetarian pacifist, so I, I find the current world that we're living in somewhat challenging. Indeed. It sure is. And yeah, there's a lot to talk about in that space, and especially like what I focus on, on kind of bringing business and government together, kind of public-private mm-hmm. partnerships, um, and eventually for the betterment of society. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about those things I'm, under, I'm... under the context of social entrepreneurship. I will use two examples because you touched on the Ukraine. So what I do, I think if you guys know, I work with different startups and um, what is amazing is, is the 
the young talents out here, they've created a program called Lifeline. Um, and what they're doing is they're managing the logistics of picking up the children because they're like drop boxes. And apparently there was uh, quite a bit of, you know, there's always a bad egg, bad people doing bad things. And there were people saying, we'll take you. And the people would get into the car and they were being robbed. And there was also human trafficking. So these, uh, what's amazing is, is these young tech techies, they created a system where they can, they can manage when they send the logistics. So they're university students here in, in Austria that, that are, and are working with Germany. What they do is they have these little chips. So everybody knows where the car is. Uh, like the airtag from Apple, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then they contact the family. So the family or whoever's waiting or whatever governmental agency is waiting for them here in Austria or in Germany. Um, they're tracked. Mm -hmm. So I'll touch, I'll touch on that. And I'll also talk a little bit of, of the one company that I'm really passionate is uh, DOT, which mm -hmm. is creating a barrier-free world for the physically impaired and particularly the blind. And I'm on their global board. So I'll touch on that. And, and I'll tell you the story of how that got started. And I think that would just kind of open up the platform. Yes. I mean, I, I'm a dyslexic polymath, so uh, I, I can yeah. imagine that. You too. Oh, oh gracious. terrible, terrible. Dyslexics together, yeah? I, I'm, I have a bit of it too, so yes. we, 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 have a, we have a club here, it seems like. Seems I, like think, a uh, I was saying to Royston, I think all the bright people who can think many things at the same time seems to have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so multi, Christian, multitasking. You... Yeah, I think the, we find creative solutions. Well, yes, you can see things from many different directions at the same time. Cool. Uh, I, I think I once, once I estimated I had thirty simultaneous thought streams. So it's it's terrible well, if you get a if you, it's terrible if you get stuck in a car with me. The last time somebody did that, so they had to go and lie down in a dark room afterwards. In, in the fetal position, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Christine, do you want to say what your thoughts are? Yeah. So just quickly, no, I, I think that. Uh, entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs a little bit like artists, they create, they create and and in these time as we need to create new solutions, new a new future, um, the social entrepreneurs are so needed because instead of being driven by the money, you're driven by social solutions. Um, and I think many entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs are, we are so driven by also passion and, and a mission often too. And, um, and since this topic is also about the sustainable recovery, I think it's also important in our social responsibility and as entrepreneurs that the sustainability is not only about around us, but also that we make sure that a social entrepreneur is living sustainably and having sustainable way of working too. I know plenty who have also worked their butt off and gotten very burned out, for instance, because maybe they didn't have enough support and this type of thing. So it's great to say, oh, let's all be social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and and let's not misuse social entrepreneurs' passion in a society. But like, let's make sure there is enough support around as well. So, But it's really the future, an entrepreneurial attitude, an entrepreneurial way with a social and a mission type attitude can really be the solution. Hmm. Fabulous. Well, look, what we're going to do, I think we're about one minute off. Yes, I don't live. know where Shiva is. I just left her message, but I didn't. Yeah, so let's see. <laughs> well, what, what I think we'll do is we'll start at uh, 4.15, which is yeah. what we designated it. We, and you're on first, Kristen. Yeah. And then, uh, then me... Then Linda, then Hacken, and then uh, yeah. she was at the end. So hopefully she'll turn up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's nice to meet you, Hakan and Linda. And nice I'm to meet sitting, you too. I also sit in Switzerland. I'm in Lausanne. Oh, lovely! You guys are neighbors. I'm going to have to come visit you in Washington then. Yeah, That's, yeah. absolutely. And my wife is actually in Switzerland right now, in Switzerland, oh, France. Huh? She's skiing, so yeah, she's. Oh uh, wow, nice! Yeah, it's very nice. a great juxtaposition of locations. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I also lived in Basel for three years, the first kind of three years of my life. So oh, yeah, wow. I, have, I have I have a connection to Switzerland as well. Well, we've got a group called Peace on the Snow in Davos. Oh um, wow! So it runs in parallel with the WEF and. Uh, 
I I'll should say that my, exactly, my, my skiing is interesting. I've been known to go down the slope backwards, whereas all, these, <laughs> all the rest of them are black, ski, black run skiers, so they have a certain amount of amusement with my uh, skiing. Well, you can, you can make fun of me. I've never done it, so I'm still want, wanting to learn. But anyway, I know it's um, 4.15, so I'll... Yeah. Okay, we go. Yeah. So firstly, can I welcome you, and uh, our topic today is social entrepreneurship for a better tomorrow. And I think in that context, we see social entrepreneurs as the first responders creating social and economic value and sustainable solutions and recovery. Obviously, that's very apropos with Ukraine, where none of us really know what's going to happen. But it, I think it's fairly obvious that there's going to have to be a, a major recovery process. And I think that women are probably the key to recovery because they have the extended family values, which are extremely important in rebuilding societies. Hello, Shiva. How are you? Do you want to put your mic on? Do you want to put your microphone on? Hello? Oh, well, that worked out well. <laughs> so, uh, Kristin is on first um, from the yes. f feminine perspective on social entrepreneurship. And I think you probably say it's a balance between the masculine and the feminine. Yeah, so thank you, Royston. Uh, it's nice to have you. So, nice to be with you and to discuss this social entrepreneurship entrepreneurship for a better tomorrow. Um, so just a few points. I, I run an organization called WIN, um, and we advance and we empower a more feminine, authentic, and global way in the world. Uh, started off with women, but it's more and more including men also as we look for ways to make a world that works for all. And um, I started this, um, I saw there were many associations and and WIN is really started as a social entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurship is the key today. Uh, I think that an entrepreneur has many similarities to an artist. We create things where others might not see anything possible. So, so that, that is really nice. And, uh, and also in environments of social entrepreneurs, there's so much passion and so much inspiration. And, and I think there is never not something that's not possible. So, so that's why I think it's really, really important now. And I think um, when it comes to sustainable recovery, from what I know of many other social entrepreneurs is, is this mission driven, this meaning driven, this purpose drive and, um, and way of being that makes this type of um, organizational form and this type of leaders uh, the keys now to the many solutions uh, that the world need. And, um, and with this sustainable need we have outside of us, as well as inside of us also. And I think in this, this case, it's very important that the, the world wake up to this resource uh, so that we get enough funding, even if it might not be for more profit and better share prices and so on, but really for better human lives and nature and so on. So I think we have to give a lot of value uh, to the social entrepreneur as the artists, the Leonardo da Vinci's, and Leonardo da Vinci's of our time. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that's what I have to say introductory. Okay. Um, well, again, uh, coming back to me, I, I mean, I'm president of the United Nations NGO out of Geneva, um, which is focused on building self-sustaining solutions. And having looked at all the well, not all of them, having a, had a good look at complexity and wicked problems, we find that it's only when you can link health, education and enterprise together that you get a self-sustaining solution. And that is also by celebrating diversity across and inclusion across all the spectrums of culture and ethnicity. Um, when it comes to social entrepreneurship, it's a very interesting uh, link between the uh, public sector government the voluntary sector and non-profits and the private sector and business, when it's all working well, they combine together to provide a secure base. And what we've found is one of the most important things for the evolution of social entrepreneurship is to provide a secure base. Even if it's a perceived secure base, you need an anchor to, uh, to move forward. And then... Uh, we are very much around the, the notion of, of how do you actually 
bring empowered individuals together. Um, we know that from, for example, Germany, the Mittelstand is the, one of the reasons why it's been so resilient in times of crisis and building this middle market of entrepreneurs is crucial. But what we've found is there needs to be some sort of holographic system that holds it all together. You've got lots of people with ideas, but sometimes they're not always that smart. So you need a, an, an ideas incubator. That also, there's people looking at the market. And again, we need to understand need because there's no point in having an idea if it doesn't represent a parallel need. And again, you need a, a smart filter to manage that. And finally, in terms of investment, there's there's lots of money out there, but it's very difficult to for it to seek a, a home. Um, I remind you that the pension funds alone have to find a home for $30 trillion every year. There's a whole mixture of family offices and family investors. By and large, when you're well away from the project, people tend to look at return on investment and risk, but increasingly... Pension funds, for example, are being asked about social impact. And uh, we had, a, had an inter I was at the pension fund conference in Cancun. And the feeling is that maybe 1% of uh, could be allocated to social impact, uh, which is still 300 billion. Now, you can see the share prices going all over the place at the moment. And pension funds have to get a return of about 5% minimum. So, maybe social impact projects are not so risky as they were once thought. You get virtually no interest return on bank accounts in terms of cash. So if you can start to begin to create this blend of um, entrepreneurship around a shared vision, and I think to do that, you need to create a fund of funds for investors so that you can balance out return on investment and risk. And then we can start to create an a mechanism to rebuild society, particularly when it's been catastrophically damaged or where the investors don't particularly understand the project product. They're just looking at a very sort of mono, monochrome view of it. So it's about creating this <coughs> holographic mechanism to really see what's going on. And we hope that, that by doing that, you can create self-sustaining solutions. And so the outcome of those is usually... Um, relationship with the environment and citizenship as well as wealth and those outcomes i think uh, need to be longitudinal i mean one of the problems with investments at the moment people tend to take a very short-term view of things i mean even in the united nations they tend to look at say 12 months or 18 months and that's linked as you know to the sdg goals and i think we need to bring together this moral compass as well in terms of investment so our view is you need to at least to look three years ahead as an investment so you have some idea whether it really works rather than just spinning the wheel like a Chinese plate juggler. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, would you like to... Sure. Proceed? Thank you for the opportunity and also uh, to be together with all of you. I have to say that social entrepreneurship has evolved. Uh, I, you, some of the things that you said that you just said resonates with me. And what I've I've been working with startups in Europe now since two thousand and eight, and it's that's evolved in a very conservative market, as you were mentioning, home offices and large uh, large companies who have their own inside innovation. And you know, the, the, there was always a word about inclusivity, and now. Uh, the big word, as you just mentioned, but we call it diversibilities. Oh. Diversibilities is, is allowing a more inclusive world for those who are physically impaired, for those who have, uh, who have talents, but I have certain physical limitations and who are not inclusive in a lot of things. So I, I have the great pleasure, uh, as, as in my background, I started out, um, in particular, working in a, uh, we have a family office, we're investors, and then I enjoyed working, uh, mentoring the startups and building it. Um, one uh, startup approached me, and they're called DOT. And i just give you a brief story about DOT. DOT was developed by a Korean who went to study in the United States in Seattle, became a Christian, wanted to evangelize to his roommate who was blind. And the problem was, is that 
he re- he wanted to go get a Bible and found out that it was the size of a conference table and he couldn't find any solution for that. So what he developed was uh, the dot pad. It is the first of its kind where you can literally, uh, it's like the Kindle for the blind. If that can make it simple, it's the Kindle for the blind. But his first product that he developed was a watch, a dot watch, which allows and works with the apps on your phone, which allows the blind person to get messages, uh, able to know the time, text. It's quite innovative and it's also inexpensive. So uh, that was the first step. The next step is he created, he wanted to create a bearer of free opportunity for the blind. And then he realized the people who are deaf also had issues, right? They have their apps, but they have issues. And I have to tell you, I was educated at the moment where there's 17 uh, sign, lang- sign languages, 17, which approach uh, which approach the, uh, the environment. And they created a kiosk now, and, the, and their POCs in, in, in the United States is getting developed as well as here in Europe. And this all began with a problem. And as as Eric was a serial is a serial entrepreneur, he stopped everything and really focused on developing the dot pad, which now Apple is is working exclusively with them. But what I wanted to say was the the, the social impact of what he's doing is he is creating a world for those who cannot see. He's creating opportunities for those who are physically impaired. His manufacturing plants. He has a certain amount of work. He only hires physically impaired people, such as blind coders, uh, assembly plant. Uh, they're deaf. He, he, he's very consistent about that. Uh, he, he sees that there's endless possibilities at your fingertips, and he promotes that literally. And he wants to give the freedom to experience any content in the world in any way, because traveling has always been an impediment for anyone with diverse abilities. Now, going back to the next uh, remark that you talked about, corporate social responsibility. And as you well know, uh, we're here in Europe. There is a new, uh, there is a very new, uh, or I think it's 2025, that all public spaces, infrastructure must have information that's accessible for the physically impaired or diverse abilities. Now, I know the kiosk was developed, and one of the pieces about the kiosk, which is nice, is that if I go to Taiwan, I understand nothing, and I feel handicapped. So the kiosk is also made for languages, not only for for the normal traveler, but it also helps you to uh, buy your tickets. So there's possibilities. They also work with the app and also with your phone, so that if I wanted to go to the museum, and the kiosk is there. There's a 3D mapping. And I get feedback on, on, on the paintings, the Mona Lisa's described. It also helps me to take a picture of me standing at the Eiffel Tower without asking for help. Online. So there's endless possibilities. And I would really love and suggest that you look at, the, at their website, which is uh, dotincorp.com. So dotincorp.com. And, then, and just scroll through that, look at some of the YouTube videos, and you'll see what it's about. But to sum this all up, when you take a young uh, entrepreneur who was passionate about sharing a story with his roommate who was blind, it evolved into something bigger in a relatively short time. It is a young company, um, and they're moving very forward quickly. Now, jumping into the current crisis here in the Ukraine, there is a program called Lifeline where a bunch of students and and techs, I'm going to call them my startup techies because I know a lot of them are, 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 we know each other. It's a small, Austria is small, but it also includes people from Germany and the CE region. And what they're doing is they're setting up these uh, logistics to pick up the people at the border so that they have safe passage Unfortunately, I have to share with you that there is uh, stories of people being robbed, mm-hmm. mistreated, and and human trafficking. So now what these young talents, these creatives have done is created a chip. So And they've created the possibility that you can track the pickup point from mm-hmm. the pickup point 
down to their look to the location that they're going to, and I and it's 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 unfortunate. It is so unfortunate that this situation has actually caused uh, a platform of talent coders, you know, AI everything, where they're working so closely together to rescue these people. And this technology will probably be used in the future for for travel, for logistics, not for saving lives. And that's another. And another thing that's gone out just to, uh, is another company called Steady Sense, and they're providing. Uh, it's like a band aid, but it, it monitors the temperature of the body. They're providing and donating those to those. Uh, camps so that doctors are aware who's ill who's not ill they get it on their app and they're they're just and this is another startup but they are actively engaged and they were the first ones moving forward and when you see what's going on here which is not a good thing in the ukraine and you see how quick these startups these technologies and they're working together and they're bonding and I, what I'm seeing is the social impact of entrepreneurship. These talents are coming up with solutions that will probably make the world not only a better place, but save lives. But in addition to that, they're already working together. What does that mean? Later on down the line, this will become a sustainable business because business people, as they're building new environments or in particular in the future when we have to think about how to rebuild the Ukraine, these talents will be able to manage uh, goods, supplies, and so forth. But most importantly, they will offer opportunities, uh, as in the case of DOT, they will offer opportunities to help those who have diverse abilities to have an impact, to participate, because DOT is also supporting with some of their technology. And these, like I said, we have blind coders, but they, they're active. They can do something. They're earning money, and they have an opportunity. Someone gave them the key, as well as a deaf person. And this is the importance, is getting people with diverse abilities involved in a society, even in a crisis that we're facing here in Europe, as well as worldwide, but making them have meaningful, relevant possibilities to change the world and to be a part of the world. I think if I could just add to what you said, it's understanding those dimensions from the, the physical, emotional, mental and spiritual dimensions, um, moving from a command and control system to a participation stroke trust. And uh, I was with the director general in UNOG a few weeks back, and she said that the one thing she sees in the United Nations as a challenge is a lack of trust and the silos. Yeah. So I think uh, what you're doing allows us to move away from that. And I think self-respect is the most common denominator that we need to enhance so that everybody is valuable and everybody is together. Hakan, please, can I introduce you? Of course, Rosh. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President of the Washington Institute for Business, Government, and Society based in Washington, but we also have offices in Paris, Oxford, Singapore, uh, soon to be in the Middle East and other parts of the world as well. Uh, we focus on three things primarily, which is technology, innovation, the global economy, and corporate social responsibility. What I'd, li I'd like to focus on is that CSR aspect, and I loved what, what was mentioned before uh, by Linda when it comes to diverse ability, I'm a father of two girls, and one of them, uh, the eldest has some disability as well. So this means a lot to me. And what we've been doing at the Washington Institute is actually putting together a significant global sports program. So when we focus on social entrepreneurship, the idea was to look at the unifying aspect of sports. Even now, of course, there was a difficult decision done by our friend, uh, the president of the International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons, who the Paralympian athletes from the Belarus and Russia were just banned from the Paralympics. I think it was a sad moment, but I think it had to be done, right? Because there was so much um, negative reaction from other athletes as well. But as far as social impact is focused, is, is concerned, uh, one of the areas, again, that we're looking at is kind of the how sports is used as a venue of good and how it unifies people, especially during the coronavirus. What we've done is, We've looked into, for example, the importance of youth development through sports, both mentally and physically. Recently, I did a fireside chat, like what we call our webinars, with the um, head of the Rhodes 
um, scholarships, um, Dr. Keish and also Tom McMillan, who is a former congressman, NBA player, Olympian. And we really focused on this aspect as well because our youth, whether here in the U.S. or other, other parts in the world, really have suffered the consequences of the coronavirus. So how do we bring together? What we did was last uh, September have a global sports conference where we brought different stakeholders together, focusing on gender equity, diversity and inclusion, sports diplomacy, again, as an avenue where we pushed partnering with UNESCO, a fantastic speaker in Gabriela Ramos, uh, who will be attending our next conference in September as well. But right now, what we're focusing on is putting together an impact report on the mm -hmm. results of what we learned in September, but also what we're expecting, you know, in Qatar 2022. And moving forward from now on, what needs to be done differently in the area of sports. For example, when Linda mentions diversity in Tokyo with the Paralympics, you know, with the everything that they had to do with, you know, the Paralympians, it's a legacy project. It's not just for the Paralympians, but it's also used as a tool for an aging society, right? Where they will need more wheelchair ramps, for example, for their metro. So these kind of legacy projects are really important in Tottenham Stadium. Not only are they playing it for football, but also, as we call it in the U.S., soccer, I mean, football, of course, in Europe and the rest of the world, uh, but American football as well. So, again, a le legacy project that kind of brings all together. So this impact report, which will be coming out end of May, early June, will be quite important. It will be shared with global stakeholders, members of Congress, sports ministers and elsewhere. And, of course, we'll be sharing with the harasses community as well. But that, I think, is going to be a different form of social entrepreneurship where we really focus on private-public partnerships. That's something that we've done, whether it's in sports or elsewhere in cybersecurity, in artificial intelligence, in other areas that we focused on. That, I think, is really important. And I think it's sometimes public-private partnerships that, that's overplayed. But in this case, I mean, think about our name, Washington Institute for Business, Government, and Society. Without business and government coming together under the umbrella of social entrepreneurship, you can't have the betterment of society. Right. It's as simple as that. Now, as far as the Ukraine is concerned and everything that's been happening, you know, Linda and Royston, you've given some great examples, you know, beyond sports, maybe another soft area that I want to focus on is supplies, food, putting a hot meal in front of people. Right. And someone who we're really proud of here in the Washington area is Chef Jose Andres. A uh, Spanish chef who has multiple restaurants here. He has really been pushing social entrepreneurship to the limit. It started with um, when the Haiti earthquake happened way back when he went there and built like the first kind of solar installation so people could go back to farming again. Now he is in Ukraine bringing hot meals. I saw him doing a Instagram live with Maria Shriver where they were raising money at like within five minutes. They, they had raised tens of thousands of dollars to help Ukraine. That to me is the epitome of social entrepreneurship. It's being able to work together, whether you're in the private sector or the business sector, or you're an individual, and how you can bring that to the betterment of society. That, to me, is a perfect example. It's what's needed. Royston, I'm with you. None of us want this. I think it's, you know, what we're going, what the world is going through is awful, having gone through two years of the coronavirus plus, and then now this war. Um, but I think there might be light at the end of the tunnel if we can work together as business, government, and society. Thank you. Absolutely. I think it's that's the whole message is finding ways where we can work together and reduce the barriers, whether they're physical, emotional, mental or spiritual. Absolutely. Um, we are very much interested in providing a secure base and recognizing that government funds are always in scarce supply, uh, which started really with the pandemics, because as you're probably aware, there are other viruses out there. Some of them are, are even worse. Um, so we started down the, the route of creating a life meal, which is a total food replacement because the pandemic wave is about 120 days. And if there's no food, then it gets bad very quickly. And therefore, we looked at a, a meal that could be a sole source of food uh, for up to 100 days, would have a, a four-year shelf life and be radiation and waterproof. And then clearly after... Uh, some of the issues with the um, uh, with COVID, etc. We we said that maybe you need to pre-stock it actually in communities rather than actually rely on the distribution train. 
sure. and then the conclusion that nobody would ever pay, for, no government will ever pay for it in advance. We we then came to the view: why not create a, a Tom's Shoes model, which is a buy to give. So you sell it retail, and for every one that you sell retail, we match it as one that's given away. And we're not naive enough to think sending one meal would actually get to the end recipient. So put 300 meals in a box with a water filter that will last three years for a family and an education tablet for the children focused on mothers and children because we found that if you have strong mothers and children, you have strong communities. And then we developed a system for tracking it so we can track it anywhere in the world. And then the, the view was you, you, um, you sell this meal through retail where it stands on its own merits. It, it's academic attainment for children by 100%. <coughs> the elderly who don't tend to eat properly, it provides powerful nutrition, which is a good offset for Alzheimer's and dementia. And again, most of us who are on the move tend to eat rubbish. So it tends to um, deal with that issue. So it's a way of like the Tom's shoes where you take a retail product that stands on its own rights and then through a simple QR code mechanism, you actually create a community. And with the education tablet, you can take a picture at the other end because one of the biggest issues of charities is transparency. I mean, we know this with the UN, you, you put money in, but you're never quite sure where it goes. Uh, and I think most of the philanthropists have a somewhat jaundiced view of, of this. So if you can create this transparency at all level and promote neighborliness, and give the end recipients a secure base. And it doesn't have to be in crisis zones. Um, I volunteered on a food bank in Vevey, which you wouldn't necessarily associate with crisis zone. Right. But we saw many, many families who just couldn't survive on the income they had and had to come to a food bank to get food. So what we find is in terms of neighborly lists, bringing people together, where they actually work as, a neighbor, as neighbors to solve problems, and I think this is going to be very much the case in Ukraine. I mean, um, people of courage uh, need to come together. Uh, hopefully this situation will end at some point. Then you, the question is, what do you do then? And huge sums of money in age agencies coming in from the top doesn't always solve the problem. Uh, it needs to get more of a bottom-up solution. Also, there's the issue of corruption as well, which is endemic across the world. I think the... Um... What's changed from before is that these things are not now done only, you know, through the military, right? And militaries, you know, the economic aspect of it, you can see, I mean, the difference here in Ukraine, Russia is eventually it'll have to come to an end because you see it from everything from Adidas to everyone else that's now not, you know, wanting to work with Russia and they've pulled their, you know, sponsorship, for example, of the Russian national team. Russia, of course, has been banned from FIFA and others. You know, so you see, again, kind of businesses, governments and others coming together. And we can talk about the merits of, you know, Russia versus other parts of the world. You know, I'm not going to get into kind of some of the hypocrisy of certain things. Right. But right now, you know, the world is united, you know, with Ukraine, rightfully. And, you know, but you think like I, I remember once when Russia and Turkey was having problems, you know, Russia, Russia basically prevented the Russian tourists from going to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a massive industry in Turkey, right? Tourism is huge. And that impact, that kind of economic impact of it was far bigger than anything else that back then Putin can do, you know, to Turkey on the probably on the military. So, I mean, yes, the, there would be there would have been far many people, more soldiers and others would have died. But the economic consequences now, I think, even with sanctions, even with SWIFT now, what we're seeing against Russia, I think you can see in the in the mid to long term, there is going to be an impact. I'm always conscious that when you're operating on the edge of chaos, which is far more common these days than uh, it was before, um, it's actually the intangibles that seem to have 80% of the outcomes. And that usually is around people and how people respond. Um, so I, I'm, I, I use the thoughts of Martin Luther King that says, if you've got darkness, the only thing that will make a difference is light. We know that the military solution by and large has never worked. So I'm wondering where the light solution is in, in this. That's a good question. Um, I mean, in, in, in Austria, you know, it's interesting to see things because I live in Vienna, but it's interesting to see, you know, which I will tell you, 
my office is right around the corner where they call it the Golden Mile. And you can imagine our best customers there were the Oliarchs and Russians <laughs> who <were laughs> going down there. And I have to tell you, it's a very quiet street at the moment because they don't dare come out. <laughs> uh, it, it was very interesting because, you know, there's a certain time of the day when the ladies were coming out and then, you know, the husbands would be going to the fancy bars that are near my office and it's, it's still, it's quiet. It is a tragedy. It's unfortunate. Um, it, it, it also kind of, when you think about it, 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 history constantly repeats yourself. The only thing is, is there's some really bad toys up there uh, that somebody has access to that is concerning, not so much about we have to rebuild the country as long as he doesn't activate the reactors over there. And that's more of the concern that we have here and nearby um, and, and why the people are fleeing as quickly as they can because they're terrified. They're terrified. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, when you talk to the children here in Austria, because they, they understand, I mean, I have five daughters, Akon, so I have a big family, five girls. Wow. I, I try to win an argument. God bless you. God bless you. That is the mothership. Uh, <laughs> I have five girls uh, and five, and uh, we say five daughter companies or a very diverse fields, and, but I have grandchildren and, you know, they're 10 and, uh, and there's two 10 year olds. One's a boy, one's a girl. And my grandson says, Nona, what kind of world is this going to be? This is really scary. And, you know, cause he's, he's, he's aware of what's going on. He knows how close Austria is <laughs> to the borders up there. And how do you answer a question like that? And I always send him, I said, you know, there's a lot more good people than there are ugly people. And he mm -hmm. was the one who says, I know, Nona, but if someone has the right to push the wrong button, then what happens? Mm -hmm. It's a point. We can, and, and we, I, I want to believe that we can help the Ukrainians rebuild and, you know, managing to take logistics and deliver things that need to be up there. But we also have to be very well aware what happens to the rest of the countries and the rest of the world. I think it's about taking personal responsibility at the end of the day. I mean, I'm reminded of the nuclear test plan, which was um, <clears throat> actually, interestingly, came from women taking the baby teeth of children and looking at the strontium-90 levels. And that actually was the major driving force behind the te test bans. So I think we we need to understand how we can use these subtle energies of people and drive change from the grassroots. Um, I would value your thoughts on how 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 do we how do we create social entrepreneurship after I think, crisis? I think we're actually seeing it. Yeah, I mean, the world is far more. You know, I mean, there's the good and the bad, right? And technology and innovation. And, you know, we look at what, what's happened with so many of the companies in the US and even the elections process and everything else. But even from TikTok to other places, you know, the images that we're seeing firsthand very quickly is, I think that's, again, a game changer and bringing societies together, businesses together, governments together, individuals together to see and be able to make, you know, look, again, is the United States and NATO going to come to the defense of Ukraine? Probably not. It's obvious that that's not going to happen. Is President Putin hopefully going to stop there and doesn't become, you know, broader, you know, NATO, for example, war, etc. It doesn't appear that way, but one can never know. But I think we're seeing, Oyston, to your point, like we are seeing that already happen. And again, mm -hmm. from all these companies and others who are taking action, the world is quite knighted in this, at least. I mean, you know, barring, you know, some of the other, other state actors who, you know, we don't need to get into, but, you know, you can see it already happening from a grassroots level. And again, like I mentioned, Jose Andres, who goes over there and does this, your businesses, you know, Linda mentioned the companies that are already involved. I mean, imagine in the midst of all of this, that there are still people out there who would think about, you know, human trafficking. I mean, how disgusting is that? I, I, that I just can't wrap my head around. But one thing I would tell you that what, what I know, because as, as I said, I, I'm sort of like in the financial district here in Vienna, is I'm, it's seen how, how swift. I mean, Austria is always neutral. And, you know, there's quite a yes. few Austrian companies that do a lot of business in the Ukraine and in Russia. 
And the fact that they, and you have to imagine, we have a bank here called Raiffeisen International, a bank. They're big in Russia. And they, they had to pull the plug. They, they said no. And it was, it was quite surprising that they actually said no. Not today, not tomorrow. No, and and it, you know, I'm not joking that the that the Russians uh, are hiding. <laughs> you don't see them anymore because they're very, uh, you know, they love their brands and they love to make sure that everybody knows that they there's you know spilling money here left and right. You don't see them anymore. They're they're quiet. They're quiet. You, the uh, uh, the Russian Austro uh, Austrian uh, society completely disbanded and crashed because they had some people who are not supposed to be there. <laughs> and for me, I've been laughing and I'm watching this, but I think, as you said uh, earlier, we are coming together, not only, uh, not only from the ground root grassroots, which has always been the case where people jump in, but what I see from the uh, financials, from the investments, from the larger companies who you know, are, are not going to be happy. They're going to have, there's going to have to be a recovery for all those business that was lost, supplying for mm -hmm. oil, uh, you know, new, new ways to provide electricity, whether it's getting those solar and windmills up and running in Germany, you know, whatever it is, they're working on it now. My husband's in the energy, so I can just share that. I know everybody's working on that to get, to make sure. Uh, what I see coming is the technology, but also these, Startups are going to come up with solutions where maybe, and, I, and this is my prayer, that we don't need to be beholden to someone to supply energy to large to to, to countries in Europe. We need. I think that needs to change, and, and and by changing that, you also create a better environment. So that could be also a social impact if we think about moving forward in the future. Is coming up with uh, clean tech, green tech bringing these talents together to develop, maybe creating a, uh, an institute, a brain, you know, brain, I call it a brain institute, but just focus on bringing in the, the, the top talents to sit down and come up with solutions so that this never, if we survive this, that this never happens again, because it is the importance is, is the technology and that I would like to see. I would invest in that. It, it, it has to create some sort of brain, uh, brain pool or institute. You're the expert over there. But just focused on clean tech, clean energy. Um, and I'm good at raising money. That, that, I've done it professionally. But I'm also, when, it, when it's something that's important, bringing these young talents and to be orchestrated, I'm going to say, Orchestrate. You need a conductor, but the conductor needs to be someone that's senior enough, so like yourself, like both of you, senior enough who can inspire, manage, and mentor these talents to make a better world. That I would commit. I would put my finger in the fire, as they say in Austria, to do something like that. I mentor all the time, and I, I mean. And I said, these young kids who are calling me and say, oh, we've got this idea. And I, you know, I flip it over to another young kid and, and it, it just grew in a matter of a week where, and I started thinking about it. Why don't we have a brain pool? Why can't we create a brain pool? Maybe Washington, Switzerland. Yep. Uh, I, I can ground it here in Austria. And the, because these young talents, these uh, they are socially, they want to make an impact. Right. They yep. also want to make money. They're positive. They're not. They're not dum dums. I'm going to tell you that, that that's the difference from the old days when they would. When we had NGOs, and I would be out there knocking on doors and say, "Could I have a hundred thousand euros for this?" They look at me like, "Oh, you know, it's not a sustainable model. Just living off of fun, uh, fundraising. I mean, donations." Right. And these kids, for the example, like Dot or the other ones, they created a possibility to make enough money to support their business, to grow their business, but also at the same time, they're donating Dot watches. You know, if mm -hmm. if you know people in Washington that would like to have a Dot watch and you want to see it, I'll send it to both. I'll send it also to Switzerland and donate it. That's that's how we're passing the message. And that that's relevant for this company and there's a lot of other companies water technology i know what kids in, that have done water technology well there's uh, a there's a company in washington war well not washington but in the u.s uh warby parker 
that does all the glasses. Um, there you go. They're two hard. They're two Harvard grads, and um, they, and they yeah. donate quite a bit the proceeds of the, every glasses that pair of glasses that you buy. Absolutely, so it's real social impact and social entrepreneurship. Just like, the, just like the watches, but going back to this brain pool, if I if I could have a if I had a wish and you guys were my both of you were my Santa Claus, yeah. I would say, please let's make a brain pool. Let's take ten talents who are committed. Um, I like it. What would be the takeaways from this? The takeaway is that we, as, as the more, I hate to use the word because I'm still a woman. I hate to say it, but seasoned, the more seasoned people in life, uh, that we will, we will be the mentors, the guides to create, to help, to help them learn from history because only, I still remember in the States when we used to have the, the bomb um, sirens. And not only that, we used to have to jump under every the first Friday of the month. We had to jump underneath the desk because of, that was the time when Cuba, the, when they directed the yeah. over here. So I remember that telling my kids that they think I'm, I'm nuts. But, you know, now they're saying, hey, mom, it's true. But if we can remind them the history, personal impact that we can also tell them as entrepreneurs and people who we are. I, I mean, I have a, I do have a other life. I mean, I, I still have about that business life, but it's not my focus anymore because I'm more involved about the next, I'm concerned about the next generation Same. and building that generation. So I'm devoted to spending my time, my network, my resources to build that. And I would love to do a, a and, and one thing that I would guard upon I don't know how it is, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but my experience in Europe is if you get university professors, forget <laughs> it. Just forget it. it. It's a killer. It's a killer. It has to be people who are committed. Um, personal gain is not there. We don't have. We don't need it. We just want to get it up and running because these kids can smell personal gain. They're so clever. But if they know and they see the sincerity – they will do everything to make it work. And I would challenge them to come up. The first challenge would be is to come up with a way to create this pool, brain pool. I'm, I'm just great. I guess this working title as I'm brainstorming with you. Uh, I would challenge them to come up with five points. First of all, business plan. Two, what is their vision for their future? To make it a better world. Three, how can they create a platform that other startups who are interested in social entrepreneurship want to be a benefit? And this platform, they can they can make it themselves. So you know, this is the one thing when I hear about platforms and I know how these kids operate, young people operate. They can make their own platform in 15 minutes and they can get up to thousands. But yes, I think it needs to just be structured and it's not a, it's not a big expense. The goal would be is to create a brain pool of meaningful, relevant, seasoned people who are committed to the same purpose of helping these young people develop, develop meaningful and purpose driven technology to make it an all inclusive world. So we don't use the word diverse, diverse abilities. I was telling this to Eric because I coined it with him. I said, listen, I'm going to tell you about diverse abilities. I don't like the word, but we're going to use the word until what, until everybody is inclusive. I'm so tired of diversity. And every time I put this, use diverse abilities. And then someday we don't need to use the word. Everything is very. You know what it is, Linda? It's almost like having the, you know, the business round table, but this time for, you know, like a brain pool round table idea and where they can actually meet frequently, come up with these kind of, you know, impact driven kind of results rather than just sure. for us. Like one of the things that we're allergic to at the Institute is just to convene. Convening is fantastic, but what comes out of it? Well, that Absolutely. would be, the, and see, that's the importance of having seasoned people. So if I, for example, if I was to get five corporates, to use that technology, whether it's producing for uh, solar, wind, to take that technology or to use their AI, whatever it is, and we get them to become uh, mentors. It doesn't cost them anything. They're, they're going to be happy to get some free tech and, and then also supply their corporate, their CSR, which you're more of an expert on. So if you can imagine how great would that be? Because by accident, we three would be introducing a different brain set 
to the corporate world, to the blue chip companies, right? I'm afraid we've actually come to time by no. the looks of it. Um, I, I think my view was the incubator, the accelerator, and the fund of funds with an entrepreneurial hub in the middle of uh, seasoned people. The main thing is to make sure you have smart filters um, because so you, you've all seen the daft ideas and the daft market needs and the daft money. So trying to keep it sensible so that you have something uh, that really works. I think that is the key for social entrepreneurship. I think that it was a great opportunity to just sit and chat and uh, to share. And you guys have my emails. I'm If you, if you want to get back to me. Well, uh, why don't we set up a Zoom call when we're... Uh, yeah, I'd love that. Can, I'd love that. We can, we can do another brain Yeah, and yeah. then Linda, let's get together in Washington too when you're yes. here. I, I was going to um, Eric, the CEO from Dot, will be in Washington before I am next week. So maybe I will send yeah. him an email. Please, and tell him please. always, always, always and welcome. I'll, and I'll send you a Dot watch. I'll send you both. Get you both Dot watches so you can take a look at it, and then we'll, Thank you. we'll continue. And, and, and don't forget the family offices, and some of the families are very large. I saw that. So. I'll follow up. With, I'll follow up with you definitely. We will be all involved and do something a good thing. I'm, I think this was actually the best uh, panel I've ever been on because we did a brainstorming. So you see, you're guilty of that, sir. When you <laughs> get all these ideas, now he's going to go in the fetal dark office and go, dark corner and go in the fetal position. We've overwhelmed him. We'll, we'll take the recording and play it back to them. That's one way to stir up uh, change. <laughs> Well, thank Everybody you. Go. It was an absolute pleasure to be with both with both of you today. You, yeah, I'm, I, I'm really delighted. And I'll be in touch and we'll have a conversation very soon, if not Same see here. each other in person. And I'm just a hopping away to your place in Zurich and you can always come to Vienna anytime. Oh, it's great. Well, I I, um, I have, a, have a, um, a soft spot in Vienna, shall we say, because I, I remember the museums and the uh, fabulous city. It is. It's fun. It is, anyway. and I haven't been in a long time, so I'll come visit at some point as well. Oh, please do, and bring your families. I'm a be- I'm a good tour guide. I'd love that. <laughs> okay. I'd love that. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much. Be safe. Be safe. Have a great weekend, too. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.